Hello, everyone. Welcome to this webinar. I'm Eli Kluchstein, Director of Content and Media at JPC. Over a week has passed since Hamas attacked southern Israel, committing atrocities against civilians and soldiers. Israelis continue to count their dead, mourn their loved ones, and bury their friends. At the same time, a ground maneuver in Gaza has yet to begin, though Palestinians have been warned to evacuate, and the Air Force has conducted strikes all week. The question of another front opening with Hezbollah remains. To discuss these different issues, the Jerusalem Press Club speaks today with Dr. Colonel Reserve Iran Lerman, Vice President of the Jerusalem Institute for Strategy and Security and former Deputy Director for Foreign Policy and International Affairs at the National Security Council. Dr. Lerman, who served for over 20 years in the IDF military intelligence, also was Director of the Israel and Middle East Office of the American Jewish Committee and today is a lecturer at the Shalem College. Thank you for joining us, Dr. Lerman. Thank you, Eli. Um... Maybe I should point to the three major uh, elements at play right now and, uh, and see uh, and, and open this as much as possible for questions. The one thing is beyond the uh, debate at this stage. Israel uh, is determined to eradicate the capacity of Hamas to pose a threat from the Gaza Strip uh, down the road. It's not going to be easy. It's a, a, large, a large organization with significant capabilities, many of them hidden underground. It's not going to be a simple or easy mission. Having said so, there is basically no option for any uh, decision maker uh, in, in uniform or at the highest levels of government, not to go through with this necessary campaign for the simple reason that otherwise it will not be possible to continue to live next door to this, I, I, for lack of a better word, Nazi model of politics uh, in, in, our, uh, in our immediate neighborhood. Uh, the horrors that we saw on uh, uh, <clears throat> what we should most possibly call like 9-11, we should get used to calling it 10-7. Uh, this, the horrors that we saw basically evoked for the Israeli people at large and for many others, including President Biden and everyone else who saw the evidence and the graphic evidence, which Israelis are not shown on their te television channels because it's simply too dehumanizing and shocking. But what they were exposed to were, were, was enough to, to uh, make them understand that uh, side by side with the imagery uh, that we've seen uh, as, from Daesh, from ISIL, Islamic State butchers, um, for, for Jews, the, the obvious frame of reference for what we saw is the revival of Nazi practices. And as we know, <clears throat> both Daesh and before them, the Nazi regime had to be brought down entirely and eliminated effectively. And this is what is going to happen. But this is going to be a complicated and messy battle fought largely over the area of Gaza City and all that is under it serving Hamas purposes. And therefore the need <clears throat> to um, first of all try to persuade as many people in the northern segment of Gaza which encompasses Gaza City to move south beyond the, uh, I wouldn't call it Gaza River, but Ra Gaza Creek, uh, to the southern part of the Strip and uh, uh, avoid being caught in the crossfire of the Israeli ground operation. Is, uh, this, this is what we are, uh, the IDF is currently uh, trying to do. Originally, it gave 24 hours. It was quickly realized that for a variety of reasons, uh, this uh, could and should be extended. I think there's an understanding uh, internationally 
that um, <clears throat> this is inevitable. I've heard very carefully what uh, Joseph Borrell said about this, as well as our uh, American uh, partners and, and strategic uh, supporters. And basically, uh, what they did not say, don't do it. What they were saying is give it uh, just enough more time so it can be done properly. But they, there's, a, I think, an understanding that this can no longer be avoided given what has happened. Thank so that's the first uh, key element. <clears throat> the second uh, element which is beginning to emerge is that there may be a clear distinction between what's going to happen uh, north of the Gaza Creek and what's going to happen south of it. Uh, and uh, today, the Israeli government, for example, resumed water supply to the southern part of the Gaza Strip in close coordination with the American administration. And here there are other players uh, uh, at work, including, of course, the Egyptians, who want to open a humanitarian corridor of supply to, uh, uh, to the population that will increasingly flow in that direction. They don't want them in Sinai, but they want to be able to uh, have some uh, channel uh, of provisions um, through their border. They are also engaged with the Americans on the question of uh, extricating from the Gaza Strip American and possibly other uh, dual citizenship uh, individuals. But uh, for Israel, I uh, assume, although uh, none of this is, is made public in any manner, that any such um, attempt to establish a humanitarian set of responses in the south, while we are preparing for uh, the fight in the north of, of the Gaza Strip, has to also include a component of regard for our abducted men, women, and children. The horror of, of children, sometimes, sometimes babies, being held as hostages, and, uh, and elderly persons, as well as our uh, young women and, and men, in uniform, the, the, the uh, need for this to be addressed is very clear. And I cannot imagine that Israel would basically allow a package of arrangements, uh, uh, the humanitarian dimension without a, the equally pressing humanitarian need to have uh, our hostages released or at least uh, well treated and uh, able to access the medical needs and so forth. This is the full responsibility of those who abducted them. And uh, regardless of the anything else that happens, we would hold each and every one of them responsible for their well-being. But uh, the, uh, the question of humanitarian relief is one of our two key leverages in this respect. The other being uh, the Gatari involvement, the role they have played in providing Hamas with safe haven and the ability to operate their high command from a distance. This is intolerable. This is beyond my comprehension that a country that does that can at the same time be uh, considered an American major non-NATO ally, uh, a title conferred upon them by the Biden administration this year. <clears throat> and so unless they uh, put out a really effective effort to help us on the hostages, I think that the, the drive to isolate and, and uh, turn the Gattari ruling uh, regime uh, into a, a worldwide pariah uh, must gain momentum. So this is the second complex. Humanitarian question, corridor, extrication of foreigners, and our own uh, demands as regards the, the hostages. 
all of this while, uh, as I said, north of Gaza uh, Creek, what we are looking at is an inevitable uh, fight to the finish to destroy Hamas. And the third element evolving is uh, the question of the Northern Front and the role of Iran and Hezbollah. Hezbollah as an Iranian proxy that would not take action unless the Iranians gave them a nod. First of all, let me, uh, let me start by saying that uh, if, if we needed any proof, we didn't, but many, perhaps others in the world did need a, a proof that uh, Iran is a force for evil in this world. All you have to do is listen to what the supreme leader Ali Khamenei said of the butchers, that he kisses their hands, he kisses their bloody hands. We need no further, as, as they say in American courtroom dramas, I rest my case. But will they get in? Some Israelis I know think that this will be an opportunity to destroy Hezbollah once and for all. And the argument can, can be made. It's a legitimate argument. At the same time, there's also a principle in military affairs of the concentration of forces and, and solving one issue at a time, if humanly possible. If you're faced with a war on two fronts, you have to fight it. But if you can avoid it, and here what kicks in is uh, this, the concept of deterrence, if you can avoid it, it's preferable to uh, leave that to the next stage of, uh, of the regional upheaval that Hamas have already uh, brought upon us. Now, um, there are three elements at play uh, that could deter Hezbollah from getting in, could deter the Iranians from giving them the order to do so. One is that the IDF is in full readiness, full mobilization, 360,000 reservists, rate of, um, appear, uh, of, of showing up for duty well exceeding 100%. That's to say beyond those who have been called, many others are pressing to be, uh, uh, to be given an opportunity to fight even if they've not been called. And with that complement, we can handle the South with much less than that and still reserve the capacity of our major forces in the North to act, if necessary. So uh, Hezbollah must be fully aware that the IDF is in the North uh, in full complement. The second element uh, added uh, um, in a very dramatic fashion is the American position with the Ford, uh, uh, Gerald Ford uh, Carrier Task Force, uh, Strike Force <coughs> getting closer, and the Eisenhower task, uh, Strike Force uh, coming in. There is significant American firepower deployed. Uh, interestingly, there's also an Air Force enhancement uh, in the region. And uh, those of us who understand a bit uh, uh, in, the, in, in such matters noted that, that it includes A-10. Now, the, the, uh, the, the Warthogs, the, the uh, aircraft specially designed to give close air support to ground operations. That's an interesting um, idea. What are they going to be assigned to do in, 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 a, in a full-scale crisis? But clearly all of this is meant to deter the Iranians. And uh, we've heard President Biden speaking uh, in no uncertain terms. Don't. And uh, it so happens that uh, I think that Amer the United States of America doesn't uh, uh, s throw around empty threats. So that's a second deterrent element. 
And the third is that Hezbollah at the end of the day was built to deter Israel from something very specific, from action against the Iranian nuclear project, which is nearing fruition. And to waste Hezbollah and leave Iran open without this deterrent element in the Tahed, uh, only because Hamas got themselves into more trouble than they ever imagined, um, I think it's a safe uh, assumption that the Iranians would rather avoid it if they can. And you hear their convoluted language, well, we understand, we have to do something. Uh, if a red line is crossed, but they don't define which one exactly, um, I'm not going to tell you that it's not going to happen. There's at least an even, even chance of 50% or upwards of that, that uh, we would have a front in the north with all the consequences. But it's not a certain thing. And there is, there, as I said, there are three factors working against it. What, uh, so, what uh, Hezbollah has been doing so far is to avoid an all-out uh, confrontation which would have uh, very far-reaching consequences, not only for them, but for Lebanon, for fragile, miserable uh, Le Lebanon uh, across the board. Dr. Lerman, that has been very clear. So let, let me just, one last sentence. Um, but instead, they are choosing pinpricks here and there, and they've taken Israeli lives in the last uh, uh, 24 hours. Not a full and all out uh, confrontation, but something that, that puts the, the onus of making the decision on our side. And this is where we are in the North right now. Okay, questions? Okay, so you've touched on many, many issues, I think. And uh, I would remind our, uh, you know, our viewers that if you have any more questions, other than those you have sent us already, please write them down in the chat box. Um, I think one question which bothers many is, do you think the decision makers in Israel have a real plan for Gaza, be it the north, be it the south, now and, and the day after the war, assuming that Israel actually manages to destroy Hamas or remove it from the Gaza Strip? What are we going to do with it on the day after? Well, I think a lot of thought is being given to the subject right now. For many years, it was moot because the IDF basically tr tried to avoid the conquest of Gaza, not because of uh, fear of casualties, but precisely because they didn't have a good question, uh, answer to this question. What are we going to do with it once we have it? But by now, uh, they, uh, there is no choice. And we would have to uh, basically let a, local, a policy of recreating a a different kind of government in Gaza uh, evolve from the situation uh, based on, on what the, the, the catastrophe that they've brought upon themselves, what do, will it teach them about the, the, the folly of such actions? Uh, since I did use the uh, imagery of the Nazis, uh, which I think is fully justified under the circumstances, let's remember that uh, no British or American uh, local governor in the uh, what used to be called Bisonia in 1945 or 46 would have said uh, three years from now there would be a German Federal Republic run by a devout pro-Western Democrat called Konrad Adenauer. Not, not that I can tell you that we have, you know, uh, somewhere in our uh, vest pocket, a, a Gaza Adenauer. But if people in Gaza and, uh, and in the West Bank come to the conclusion that there's a lesson to be learned from this catastrophe, then maybe we would have something to work with. The, uh, the easy assumption that we can uh, simply bring over uh, the governance from Ramallah uh, after, the, uh, after the war, I think is um, misguided, to put it mildly. Um, Abu Mazen, an 88-year-old anti-Semite with uh, very limited capacity for governance, certainly not and, and, and cor and surrounded by corrupt um, apparatchik, as they used to say in Russian, um, 
is not the, the person or the administration or the kind of governance that Gaza would need. So we're going to face a very complex uh, transition, but with some external support, regional and international, um, I believe we can offer uh, the people of Gaza an alternative um, that would emerge from within their own ranks. Okay, now, do you think Israel still enjoys enough international credit for a long-term war in Gaza that might include scores of dead and wounded Palestinians? And is there anything Israel can do with its allies to make this credit last longer? Well, I, I, of course, I'm aware that uh, in the media and in progressive circles, people with uh, sensitive uh, legitimate worry about uh, civilian losses, uh, find, it, find the, the continuation of the fighting uh, difficult to understand. But at the, I, at the same time, I believe that the understanding that Hamas must be eradicated um, has gained a very firm hold on the minds of very large segments of the public in the West and certainly uh, the leadership. And we saw the language coming not only from Biden, but also from uh, Macron and Sunak and Scholz and, and, and uh, Maloney uh, in the common statement that they issued on the 9th of October. Um, I think this understanding is very solid. Uh, whether it will hold depends on the effectiveness, decisiveness, and uh, um, and ultimately the manner in which we conduct these operations uh, we've seen before the international community come behind us uh, for example in, in lebanon in 2006 when hezbollah came in and this and, and this support dissipated over time but the provocation of hezbollah in in 2006 not only pales is is irrelevant. They killed soldiers and uh, and, and took their bodies uh, to uh, to even begin to compare this to what the international community knows and, and the international media knows about what happened here on the seventh of October. Okay, one journalist is asking about the role of Russia, which was considered friendly to Israel in the past. I would say and has seemed to pick sides in this conflict very clearly. Why did Putin do this, despite Israel having been cautious not to go against them when it came to Ukraine, for instance? Well, uh, there's certainly a uh, bitterness here, uh, given the caution Israel uh, took, mainly because of the Syrian situation, uh, in terms of our um, policy, or sp not, not our moral uh, position on Ukraine, but certainly our practical uh, level of support. So there's a sense of, uh, of anger and disappointment. Having said so, um, I would discredit from the, my limited uh, understanding of I'm picking up reports, analysis, uh, suggestions that the Russians were directly involved or indirectly via uh, the Wagner, so-called Wagner force uh, in, in training and preparing uh, uh, Hamas. I think that's uh, there's not no solid evidence pointing at, at Russia. There's plenty of solid evidence pointing at Iran. Having said so, there are two points to be made. One is that the Russians are now very much in bed with the Iranians, who have supplied them with the Shahid 136s and other items in the war in Ukraine. And so uh, Russian-Iranian relations are much closer, which accounts for for Putin's stance. Moreover, once the Americans took a very, very firm position under Biden's leadership on, uh, on the, the first day of the war, uh, the Russians are obviously tempted to line up uh, with the other side. Uh, the, uh, the instinct of if the Americans think so, we must do uh, or say the opposite um, <clears throat> is very deeply ingrained. In, in Moscow, uh, certainly uh, since uh, since the war in Ukraine began and the West uh, lined up um, behind Zelensky. 
So we, I should read all of this more as a reflection of, uh, of broader issues from, for Putin rather than uh, a specific support. He did express his shock at the manner in which Hamas carried out their attack. Okay, we have time for a last question, um, which one report asked about the Saudis, which have signaled through Mohammed bin Salman they, that they are not liking what they're seeing in Gaza today in the past few days. Uh, several publications even claim that the normalization process has been frozen. Is this something that can be repaired? After all, we do know that some claim that this whole attack was planned to, to stop, to block this normalization process. It was certainly one of the motivations uh, writ large of uh, Hamas and their Iranian uh, allies. Uh, they are not working for the Iranians, uh, but they do work with the Iranians. And they had this, the common purpose of destroying the uh, prospect, not yet determined, but the prospect of, uh, of normal, Israeli-Saudi normalization. Um, I'm not surprised it's frozen. Um, Arab leaders, no matter how author authoritative or authoritarian, uh, do have a, a near to the ground and, and, and public opinion in much of the Arab world is uh, disgustingly sympathetic to what happened. But I would, I would offer the suggestion that uh, MBS does understand that what we are doing, we are doing not only for our future, but for the future of the region, because if Hamas uh, seems to be the force that prevailed in this, uh, in this war, the consequences would be, would be very severe for any force for moderation in the region. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Ron Elman. We could have continued talking for a long time, but I'm afraid our time well, is up. I'm Thank ready. I stand ready to do this again uh, uh, when necessary. Okay. Dr. Ron Lerman, Vice President of the Jerusalem Institute for Strategy and Security and former Deputy Director for Foreign Policy and International Affairs at the National Security Council. Thank you again for coming today. Thank you, everyone. Stay tuned for more activity of JPC in the near future. And uh, personally to Rachel, good to see you again. And uh, my best wishes to you and the family. Thank you. Good night, Thank everyone. You. Bye. Bye.